Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Ham, thank you so much for being on ARC's podcast. To tell the listeners a bit more about yourself and Chipper Cash, what does Chipper Cash do and what problems does it solve? Max, it's great to be here with you today. Thanks for having me. Chipper Cash, in the most simplest form, allows people to not only interact with their money very easily, but to send and receive money to friends, relatives, people they work with across borders in a very easy and cost-efficient manner. We're going to dive into kind of the product and the different features that you offer and hmm. what sets you apart later. I think it would be really interested in the story behind founding Chipper. You grew up on a continent and of Africa, and as I understand it, you then were educated in the US. Then there were some kind of back and forth between different countries. You ended up with a co-founder would be really great if we could get kind of the inside story into how Chipper came to life. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really quite uh, fascinating every time we sort of take a moment to pause and see what the product is today and sort of how we started, you know, two and a half years ago. I just described today what our core feature is, cross-border peer-to-peer payments. But, you know, we have exciting other products coming online Stock fractional U.S. stocks across a number of markets, Visa cards, exciting suite of business products, crypto products in some markets. But to sort of take a step back and see how it all started, we have to go back to, at least with regards to the chip of journey specifically, we have to go back to 2012 when I studied at college in Grinnell in Iowa in the U.S. I just moved from Uganda to the U.S. to study at Grinnell College. And it was an exciting transition. I was, you know, this young 18-year-old at the time, couldn't wait to take on the world and learn and, you know, just sort of immerse myself in a new culture. And at that time, when I was studying at Grinnell, I was fortunate enough to meet Majid, my co-founder. And at the time, Majid, I like to tease people all the time that uh, he doesn't show, but uh, he's two years older than me. So at the time, he was a junior <laughs> and I was a freshman. And it was very much like a mentor of mine, you know, took me under his wing, showed me around, got me immersed in the tech scene at Grinnell. And one thing that really brought us together was we both grew up in Africa. You know, I was born and raised in Uganda. Major was born and raised in Ghana. We spent our early childhood and formative years in Africa. And growing up on the continent gave us a number of experiences, insights. Essentially, it framed how we viewed the world in a very specific way. And then we had this really incredible opportunity and privilege to be able to come to school and be educated in the West. And we believe that we had to do something with that. We had to leverage the fact that we could take what we've learned from how people operate, how businesses are built, how problems are solved in the US, and apply that to what we know to be key problems that people still face in Africa to a large extent. And so that sort of thinking is what brought us together. I and mean, we worked on a number of things while we in college together, just you know, tackling small problems that we thought were exciting. We ultimately told ourselves that at some point, you know, soon after we graduated, we wanted to start something together. And so he graduated in 2014, moved out to the barrier, worked at a number of farms here in the barrier, Yahoo, Imager, Flickr. I graduated in 2016. And I worked at Facebook after I graduated, but that was in Dublin, Ireland. So I had to leave the U.S. and move to, to Europe for two years. And then right before I left in the summer of 2016, Major and I got together in San Francisco. We took a road trip down to L.A., just spent the time 
trying to hone in on exactly what we wanted to do, or at least what we wanted to commit ourselves to, to researching and sort of tackling going forward before we both left the country. He had to leave because his OPT, which is a temporary work authorization, had run out. So we sort of were both at this very interesting point in our lives where we both had to leave the U.S. for immigration purposes. I had to leave because I didn't get my work visa to stay in the U.S. So that road trip to, to, to L.A. from San Francisco in 2016, right before we left the country, was probably the point where we decided that, all right, this is what we want to do. We want to do something around intra-Africa payments. Much had been done around payments in Africa, but that was really around remittances, people that send money into Africa. There had been, I think, a lot of progress with mobile money, but mobile money, again, had really focused on solving payments within a specific country and more so within a specific telco network. And so there really been no significant improvement in cross-border payments in Africa. People who wanted to send, you know, from Nigeria to Kenya or Uganda to South Africa uh, and so forth. And that was incredibly exciting to us because we knew that it was a massive, massive opportunity. We had seen how tough it was growing up in Africa. My parents are both self-employed. So I'd seen them struggle to send money or to receive money from people they worked with in different countries. And it was really that moment before we left the country in 2016 that we decided that uh, this was what we wanted to do. And then as we both went to different parts of the world, we'd stay in touch and keep thinking about this particular problem. And so I was at Facebook for two years. It was a great experience there. I really enjoyed a company that I worked at and that I, at the time, Facebook was in terms of its stage of growth. It's a much bigger company now. So I was fortunate enough to join at a time when it was really, really going through massive, massive rates of growth and just learn a lot and be around very smart people. And those two years were really, really impactful from a professional perspective. And then in 2018, we both made the decision to leave our jobs and start chipper full-time. And so I moved back to the Bay Area in 2018 and essentially began a second process of immigration, trying to get my U.S. immigration sorted out while trying to get the company off the ground and raise that initial round of funding. So that initial process, that second half of 2018 was very, very painful and brutal. But anything that is worth doing ultimately is, is worth you know, going through moments of difficulty and sacrifice for. And this was definitely the case. So we, we had no second thoughts about what we're doing. We were very committed, but it was definitely a lot more difficult than we, we expected it to be. But, you know, that's really how we got to 2018 and studying the company and why we started with cross-border payments. It's been an exciting journey ever since then. I mean, we've just started the company still two and a half years old. We've barely scratched the surface on growth and the opportunity that we're working against. But it's quite humbling how much has happened since then. I mentioned we have about 3 million users. We've now been able to expand to six countries, uh, including the UK, which is our first country outside of Africa. We've launched a number of exciting products in addition to our cross-border product. We've raised over $50 million in venture capital money. That's been something that has definitely fueled and powered the growth of the company. We have over 120 employees today. And we'll be hiring another, you know, possibly 100 employees throughout the course of this year. So it's been an exciting journey so far. Definitely exceeded our wildest expectations, but uh, in many ways reaffirmed our belief about how much there was to do regarding cross-border payments, how much remains to be done regarding cross-border payments in Africa. So we have our work cut out for us. Right. Before coming to the cross-border payments, maybe taking a step back and thinking about timing, which is so crucial in terms of building technology and maybe also investing in technology. So maybe this is a rhetorical question, but what do you think, and without obviously taking away any of the value that your product provides, but how important do you think timing is in terms of kind of if you look at the tech scene in Africa and kind of the ecosystem coming together, we've heard 100 million invested from MasterCard in their Airtel today. So recently, we had a big announcement with, with PayPal and Flutterwave. Are we kind of at a tipping point where large-scale tech companies can take off? Yeah, timing is absolutely important. It's one of several ingredients that ultimately determine success, along with luck and a few other things, and definitely also hard work. 
but timing is crucial. I mean, one thing that Warren Buffett says a lot is that in addition to his own talent and ability to make good decisions, he was also very lucky to have been born in the U.S. and to have been born at the time that he was born in the U.S., right? If you plus or minus that by 100 years, things are very different in terms of his own trajectory and what he's been able to do. And that goes for everyone, right? If Jeff Bezos tried to launch Amazon 30 years before he launched it, before the internet, before online payments, before all the things that you need to make an e-commerce website work, it probably wouldn't have been as successful. So timing is crucial. And that applies for Chipper as well. Many things have to sort of align for you to have a chance at success. And that, especially with an ecosystem that's as young and fragmented and diverse as Africa's fintech ecosystem, that's particularly true. Mobile money was important and had to have happened before a product like Chipper could be successful. And so, you know, there's a function of standing on the shoulders of giants that keeps applying to multiple instances, and this is one of those. And then also, there is a function of being able to have the right tools to put together to have a good solution. And that means things like AWS. So, you know, we don't have to worry about building our own data centers. We can leverage an already very efficient and scalable infrastructure or things like, again, like the internet, you know, so we can actually operate a company like ours across multiple geographies and still be efficient and communicate efficiently. And then obviously, I think people today, having sort of seen and had a sense of what other parts of the world are able to do with money, their own expectations and needs change, right? If you know that somewhere in the world, someone can send a text and it's served instantly, you're less comfortable with using snail mail, even if that's the reality of your world, because you know someone else is using a significantly more efficient system. And payments in much of the magic world is much the same, right? People know that other parts of the world, sending money isn't as hard or as expensive, and so they're less likely to be content with having to pay an arm and a leg to send money across borders or wait long times for it to be received. So that's another really important piece. And then also, you know, other aspects of, I think, products like ours is crucial is distribution. And so that comes back to mobile platforms like Google Play Store and the Apple App Store. And those things also have to be active and vibrant for a solution like Chipper to be successful. So to go back to your original point, timing is crucial. And in many ways, you know, launching Chipper in 2018 was a more viable prospect than it was in 2008, just because of how many things that happened between that period of time uh, that I've mentioned to, to make it possible. Now, with regards to sort of at a macro level, what we've seen in the industry and, and what we've seen with other large players, you know, Airtel today, the announcement with the investment from MasterCard, uh, Flutterwave, a partnership with PayPal, and their own announcement a few weeks ago, raising their Series C. These are all exciting events that reflect the growth and the evolution of the ecosystem. We're at one of those stages in this particular massive paradigm shift, which is fintech in Africa, that I think is analogous to sort of being at the very early days of the internet in general, right? If you sort of take yourself back, if you had a time machine and you could go back to 1994, when really a lot of internet companies were getting off the ground, knowing what you know today, right? What would you try to build? That's sort of like fintech in Africa today. Knowing what we know in terms of how easy and how advanced payments are in other parts of the world, how do we build those same efficiencies and those same conveniences and those same features into payments for much of the emerging world. And that's going to be a function of massive investment. So it's good to see companies like MasterCard. It's good to see companies like Flutterwave and Chipper raising significant amounts of money because this is going to take investment. And ultimately, this ecosystem only benefits from those events. The pie still has to grow so much bigger before it's ever at a point of saturation or anything of that sort. So we are particularly excited and we welcome all events where we see more activity, more investment being poured into this space and, and this particular ecosystem. And I think every time we see those events happening, it's a reflection of the advancements that have happened, how much more attractive the opportunity is. I tell everyone I speak to about this that the underbanked and unbanked populations of Africa 
I think is probably the biggest opportunity today in the world period, serving those those populations. And so people are seeing this clear as a result of obviously companies like Flutterwave blazing a trail, and I hope Chipper has been a part of that in terms of showing the massive opportunity that exists. And every time we see more and more activity, we're excited because it's clear that a bigger and bigger light is being shone on our part of the world. So I welcome all those investments. I welcome all those partnerships. I'm excited for them. And I think we only all get better as a whole as we have more activity and more participation in our in our ecosystem. You touched on mobile money and you said kind of it's probably better to start to work cash in 2018 than 2008. And that time frame of you know the late 2000s, that's what many people associate with M-Pesa and just mobile money in Africa generally. I think you also just mentioned that mobile money mostly is a phenomenon that is playing out inside countries and not so much for cross-border payments. So thinking about the history of you know mobile money and generally also cross-border payments in Africa and you growing up on the continent, could you maybe give us an insight to like how it actually looked historically and how the status quo still is looking to a large extent today? I understand you've also lived across different countries in Africa. I think you also just mentioned that your parents also had to kind of send money to other countries. So how did that actually look practically? Like, did you have to go to a bank or did you actually use a mobile money operator and wait in line at a kiosk? Or How can we imagine the historics and the status quo? Yeah, mobile money, I think, was and remains probably the most exciting, most impactful innovation that's come out of Africa in, you know, I want to say the last 50, maybe even 100 years. Its impact has been profound. In Kenya alone, I think it's been responsible for directly lifting something like 2 million people out of poverty. Or it's hard to overstate how profound its impact has been and continues to be. I have massive respect for, obviously, Safaricom and M-Pesa having been the first ones to launch. And then eventually MTN and Airtel and others have scaled similar products across the continent. But to give you a sense of what things were like before, if you wanted to send money, let's say just even in the same country before you even go cross-border, from one person to another, you have to get in a car or a bus, drive to that person, or have someone else get in a car or a bus or some form of transportation, drive to that other person and meet up and give them the money. That was the only way it happened. The adoption of bank accounts in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, Uganda in particular, is so low, it's probably insignificant. It's like no one uses bank accounts. Even those who use bank accounts don't really use them. And when I say that, I mean people like my dad. My dad has a bank account. I'm fortunate enough to come from a well-to-do family. In some ways, you can say I come from the top 5 or 1% of Ugandans. So in that sort of small, tiny sliver of people, most people have bank accounts. But even my dad, because of most people that he dealt with not having bank accounts, he didn't really rely on his bank account that much. He had to use cash all the time. He had to meet up with people if he had to pay them. It was terrible. It's kind of crazy to think that that happened in our lifetime, right? But at the same time, you have people, you know, going to the moon or, you know, (laughs) people building exciting products on the internet. Uh, And in Uganda, you used to have to travel miles and miles and miles to send someone money physically. And so when mobile money came around, it was profound. The idea that, A, you could actually send a text and someone gets that money instantly, that just changed everything. It changed the economy. It changed efficiency. It just literally changed everything. And then also, secondly, the fact that you could actually store your money digitally. You didn't have to carry cash around all the time. You could keep that money in your mobile money account on your phone. That as well was it was unheard of. And so those two things were profound in affecting how entire economies in sub-Saharan Africa operated, how much more efficient they could be, how much wastage was reduced from a human inefficiency perspective, from a capital perspective, all across the board. And so it's really, really strong adoption was a result of the fact that people have obviously wanted to be able to send money and deal with money easily, but didn't have the option to do that. And when this thing comes around, of course they're going to use it. And of course they're going to use it religiously because there's nothing else that comes close to it. 
and I think as we sort of went through those years, and we we'll still go through those years, and as mobile money keeps to evolve, I think people have sort of looked into, all right, what's next? Now that I can send money to someone in Uganda easily, what about someone, you know, sending money to someone in Kenya or in South Africa? And that's where products like ours come into play. I think mobile money is a fantastic innovation and will continue to do to be so. And products like ours actually leverage and work in sync with mobile money because we sit on top of that infrastructure. All money that comes to our ecosystem originates and terminates in mobile money. So that is a very fundamental and important layer to our operations. It's sort of analogous to how with Venmo or Cash App in the US, the banking infrastructure is where all money originates and terminates. So if you have a Wells Fargo or Bank of America account, ultimately that's where your money sits and you use Venmo and Cash App to send money easily. Chipper is that, but for cross-border. And so just to show you the shifts and sort of how people have come from having to deal with physical money and storing it in physical form to then being able to store it digitally and send it digitally via mobile money. And now looking to be able to do that cross-border with the same efficiency and convenience. It's sort of moving from a world of atoms, which is a very difficult world, to the world of bits, which is a significantly more scalable, more efficient world as far as money goes. Right. And I think that is what many people would wonder if they think about M-Pesa and mobile money and then contrast that with the fees that are still today attached to cross-border payments, that huge problem that you just described that still needs to be solved and is being solved by Chipper. And just to give some context to the listeners, and maybe we went over those numbers already in the intro, but specifically in a currency corridor between South Africa and Kenya, so to send $200 from South Africa to Kenya, according to numbers from the World Bank, banks still require fees of between 20 and 30 percent and mobile transfer operators such as MoneyGram or Western Union, they range around 15 percent. And then you have a whole host of newer, maybe more innovative money transfer operators such as World Remit, Hello Pesa, Mama Money that are kind of falling into the sub 10 percent fee category. And then you actually have cheaper cash at the very bottom with around 5%. So could you maybe give us a little bit of insight into, probably without giving away your secret sauce, to the extent that you can, we'd love to hear it, but why these fees, especially for the banks and for the traditional money transfer operators, are so high? Is it Do they still have a lot of pricing power? Is it legacy infrastructure? And if yes, what is it? Is it like that they have to use old banking rails or why are these fees still so high? Yeah, this is true. It's atrociously expensive. And I'll try to answer your question as best I can. It sort of reminds me of this very funny phrase Steve Jobs used to say. He used to say, isn't it funny, a ship that leaks from the top? (laughs) And the idea was that he tries to hold himself to some standard that you know the rest of the company is held to as far as confidentiality and being respectful to the proprietary work that they all do. And you know the same applies here in the sense that uh, we've taken great care and thought and innovation to make our products as innovative, as efficient as possible. One of the biggest barriers to people participating in cross-border money movement in Africa is cost. So unless you can solve that barrier meaningfully, you're really not going to change the landscape. And so solving it is very, very hard. There are multiple things, multiple forces at play at a macroeconomic level, at a microeconomic level, at a technological level. Uh, And so really you have to make improvements in multiple areas, some big, some small, for the total movement of the needle to be significant. And we try to approach it in in that manner, where we try to see at every touch point, where can we be more efficient? And where can we save people and us money? And ultimately, that adds up. And as a scale as a company, we get better at this. This is a problem that, like I said a few seconds ago, is very difficult. And solving it is partly a function of capital. You know, I mentioned how much money we've raised today, over $52 million. We've been able to invest significantly in processes in operations 
that help bring that cost down. And we are barely scratching the surface. We have a lot more to do in all the areas we're investing in to really keep moving the needle more. But I think ultimately there is no scaling cross-border payments significantly without addressing the cost issue. The 20% you mentioned, banks actually charge that much for you to send money. Like I said, I know this because I've seen firsthand my parents do this when they were sending money to people in South Africa or people in Kenya. Or if you want to find something cheaper, you find a Western Union outlet, you go there, you use that product that has its own other costs beyond money, like time, inefficiency, security, in terms of, you know, people don't like having hordes of cash that they move with into a store and, and give or pick up. And so the whole sort of dynamic around moving money in Africa is costly. And our approach to this is we're building for the long term. We know that this is not a solution that's going to be achieved today or tomorrow. It's going to be a continuous effort and continuous investment across the board that will ultimately get us there in the next couple of years. And we are hopeful that we can be part of that solution. We don't expect to be the only ones. I talked about the ecosystem as a whole becoming more vibrant and more active. I think that all of us, as we participate in the space more, play a part in bringing that cost down. I keep telling our team and everyone we work with, Chipper's success is not going to be a function of others failing. It's actually going to be a function of others succeeding. This is a very, very large space. We're speaking about a billion plus Africans and growing very fast. No one person is going to be the ruler of the whole space. But I think if we all sort of push the needle forward in our own respective ways, collectively, the whole ecosystem will be changed and improved for the better. And so that's sort of how we view it. But we know on our part, we have a work cut out for us. We have many things that we need to figure out and solve and become more efficient in. And ultimately, we'll hope to see those prices come down even lower. Previously, you mentioned distribution being so important to your product. And in, let's say, raise to this $1 billion that you were just talking about, I'd be super curious how you started out. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like you were still partly also in the U.S. when founding and starting Chipper. So how did you kind of bootstrap your growth in, I don't know, one, starting maybe with one African country, or did you kind of start out already with the cross-border functionality? Would be super interesting to hear kind of maybe the inside stories, how the first few users came on board. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that we've always sort of had to be very efficient amongst growth, because I mean, prior to mid 2019, it was very hard for us to attract capital as a company. And kind of this goes back to my point about the whole growth of the ecosystem. Before Chipper, the only companies that had really raised money successfully in Africa was Flutterwave. And if there's only one, it, it makes it very hard to tell the narrative of potential and growth. And so it was a tough market for raising money in Africa. Today, I look at the news and I see 20 companies in Africa that have raised money in the same week. And that's just incredible. But at the time, it wasn't the case. And so it was even harder. And that means we had to be more efficient with whatever little money we had. Major and I, my co-founder and I, we, we put all of our savings into the company. We literally came to not being able to make rent anymore because we had to spend all the money we had to pay the early employees, pay for some of the growth initiatives. And so as a function of being that scrappy, we had to be really smart about how we looked at growth. And so we have always been a company that grows organically, which means that most of our growth isn't growth that we pay for in an acquisition perspective. We actually build the product so that people who use it are the ones who grow the product. If someone uses cheaper today, we make sure that the product is not just utilitarian enough, but we make sure that it's easy enough for them to share with their friends that they like it so much that they'll have to tell someone else, a friend, a relative, anyone about it so that they can also get it. And that's what's powered most of our growth and continues to power most of our growth today, that organic referral growth mechanism. And in many ways, that's the most powerful endorsement you can get is word of mouth from anyone as a product. So for us, ultimately, aligning ourselves with that as an objective was very successful for us in the beginning and continues to be so. Today, obviously, in much of the magic world, as I'm sure you know, Android is by far the dominant mobile operating system. And so 
that's a platform that we've really invested aggressively in building for. We also offer an iOS app, and we're also investing in USSD as well as an operating system. But Android is just so dominant that as far as distribution goes, if you're trying to cover the most ground, that's a platform that you have to build the product to be successful and to be optimized for. So a combination of those things and sort of those constraints are what determined how we did growth and how we optimized for it in the very early days and in many ways still do to this day. Talking about growth, it's not only your user base that grew really exponentially over the last two years or a little bit more, it's also your product portfolio. So as far as I understand it, you started out with sending and receiving cash. Today, you also offer virtual visa cards, you offer bill pay, airtime, invest in crypto and stocks. You even have a solution for merchants. Can you talk us through the decision process, kind of what goes into determining which product to launch, when, and maybe even about the future roadmap? Absolutely. The product has evolved very much in the last couple of years, the last year specifically. As you mentioned, we, we, know we offer airtime, bill pay. We have a Visa card that we offer. We issue Visa cards to our users. That's something we've done in partnership with Visa. We offer U.S. fractional stocks so people can actually buy stocks on the U.S. stock exchange, fractional U.S. stocks, kind of like Robinhood. You know, we offer crypto in some markets um, so people can buy and hold crypto in a safe and easy manner. And really, the idea is that in the most simplest form, we sort of fall back to what our users want from us as being the deciding factor in what we do next. We listen intently to our users. We ask them, what can we do to make the product even more valuable for you? And we aggregate those responses, the data, and we make a decision on, all right, what products are impactful in terms of from a user perspective, uh, what products are aligned with what we're already offering, the synergies that can be leveraged, and what products do we think reflect the future of the space we're in and, and in many ways accelerate or initiate paradigm shifts that we see happening or we see to happen shortly. And so we sort of look at it from those lenses and perspectives. Ultimately, for us, having a product which offers our users world-class financial services in the most convenient manner is what we work so hard for every day. I mentioned how people's exposure to what others in other parts of the world can do in many ways determines their own levels of content or their own aspirations. It wasn't until I got to see how easy it was for money in the U.S. that I felt like, wow, we have so much more to achieve in Africa in many ways, exposure is a powerful thing. And with the internet and you know the connectedness of today's world, much of today's young generation in Africa, and Africa is mostly a young continent, their expectations for money and how they interact with money, their aspirations are not the same as previous generations. Today's generation knows and has seen what the world has to offer. And we are trying to make sure that we offer those same levels of service, those same functionalities to this generation that expects and wants them as well. And ultimately, as long as we can keep doing that, we will do well as a company. So our product portfolio reflects in many ways what our users want from us the most, and also where we see tremendous value being available to be tapped at in the market. So for now, it's a very aggressive product portfolio. And you know, I mentioned investing significantly in the product. These are the ways that we do that through the products that we offer. And as we keep scaling, we'll likely offer more products as well. But for now, I think we have probably the most exciting product portfolio of any financial platform uh, on the continent today. Right. And you just mentioned crypto, buy, sell, and hold Bitcoin via the chipper wallet. When people think about emerging markets and cross-border payments, they probably also think crypto, but more in regards to payments. So is that something you're also thinking about incorporating crypto at some point, either sending, enabling people to send Bitcoin across borders or have using blockchain more from an infrastructure layer? And maybe as a second part to that question, 
do you think it could be easier to penetrate new countries using Bitcoin, for example? Or is there still too much kind of KYC and AML requirements associated with that? So that wouldn't really be the right strategy. So a couple of points there. We do not incorporate Bitcoin in our operations. So we don't use crypto or anything of that sort in our operations. The product that we offer to our users is a very simple and safe. The keyword here is safe crypto product. It allows them to have exposure to it. And that's mostly for, you know, in a savings capacity. So you can buy some Bitcoin, hold it in your wallet, then you can sell it. One of the things I think that is still important to understand with Bitcoin and its adoption is that it's been, I think, viewed as a black market type financial product, which a lot of central banks do not like. And even I agree with them in the sense that you do not want a service or product that makes it hard to weed out bad behavior. We go to great lengths. We have the most robust compliance operation of any company that's doing fintech, I believe, on the continent today. And our objective is to be the best globally. We invest significantly in this area. We have all sorts of policies, procedures, programs on our compliance end that run under the hood to make sure that we are tracking everything. We have very thorough KYC. Only users who are fully KYC can use our products and our platforms. And so when we offer Bitcoin, we do so in a very safe manner where we're offering it in its form as a savings mechanism, not in its form as a way to bypass regulations or to bypass a transparent way to interact with people. I think its future is inevitable. Uh, There's no getting rid of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or blockchain technology. And so what I think as a whole, the ecosystem that includes players like us and others who are looking to offer this product in different countries, what the work that has to be done is to make sure that its adoption is done so in a safe and transparent manner. But it's an inevitable occurrence today where we are in the world. My advice to a lot of people or a lot of regulators is that work closely with the partners who are offering this and build procedures, build regulations, build processes that allow this product to be consumed in a safe manner. Whenever something is banned outright, what that forces is people to go into dark corners and keep using it. People won't stop using it. They're just going to do it in an even more unsafe manner. And we prefer for it to be used in a safe manner because we believe very strongly in what it can do to make the overall financial system globally more efficient. Now, as far as sort of your second question as to if we look at it as a way to expand it to new markets and if KYC is a blocker, I just mentioned how we are very thorough with compliance. Now we invest aggressively. We spend millions of dollars every year on just our compliance function. We actually look at that as a good thing. We don't do anything, we don't offer any product unless we fully KYC a user because A, it's good for the ecosystem and B, it's also good for the users. Users want to know that the platform that they're using is safe. Other people on the platform have been vetted and there's a guarantee of no bad activity happening on the platform or at least no bad activity happening at a wide scale on the platform so that they can have confidence in using that platform. And so... We don't look at that as something to avoid. We look at that as something to embrace and something to actually double down on. And so with regards to crypto, any form in which we infuse it in our products going forward will have to be in that manner. There's companies still that have done a great job on this. I think Chain Analysis is one of those companies that's really trying to bring crypto to be adopted in a wide scale, mainstream fashion and have the same transparency in it as we do with fiat currency. So that's an important piece that I think is worth highlighting. Uh, and then ultimately about you know crypto's adoption in Africa, I think at the end of the day, it'll come back to how easily someone can convert their crypto to fiat. And until that on and off ramp process can be really reliable and thorough and efficient, its adoption is going to be limited because it really does you no good to have Bitcoin, right? If you can't buy bread with it, then it has no value to you. And so there's still quite a ways to go, but I'm optimistic that, you know, working closely with the different stakeholders in this, you know, consumers, other innovators, regulators, 
I think there's a very safe and very exciting way that Bitcoin can actually be part of people's day to day lives. Not just not just Bitcoin, but cryptocurrency as a whole can be part of people's day to day lives in a very safe manner. I think we also agree on the safe part and especially kind of education as well, kind of educating people also around things like tax implications and so forth around crypto as we're getting into this world where we're also maybe moving closer to sending cryptocurrencies regularly and so forth. So yeah, I think those are really great points. Finishing up the conversation, we be really curious if you've kind of how the last 12 months under COVID at Chipper kind of, obviously it was a very hard time for a lot of people. On the other hand, I suspect kind of with them shift away from cash to cashless, the company probably has seen a lot of growth. So be curious, you've probably seen in your businesses shift away from cash to cashless, but if there are other kind of learnings you got out of the last year? Yeah, it's been a very eventful year for everyone, but particularly I think for businesses in the financial space. I think COVID has sort of accelerated some industries, I think, you know, remote work, Zoom, and I think in some ways financial services in the sense that people have relied on them even more so now than ever before. And we've seen that same behavior with our users, that the need to be able to support others or receive support from others has only heightened in this time over the last year, year and a half, when COVID has been particularly disruptive. And for us, it sort of reminded us of the importance of the work that we do to make sure that we remain as reliable as ever, that we don't forget ultimately who we're building this for, which is consumers and our users. Seeing that very unique reliance and expectation that everything else is sort of failing around me, but at least I can count on Chipper to do this, which is very important. That's a very humbling and a very unique position to be and so we've embraced that and in many ways taken it to heart and 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 it's infused you know how we operate it's such an exciting opportunity to have in terms of impact and i think going forward it's something that will be a reminder to us as to why we have to be that much more reliable that much more efficient that even small things at our scale are very important and that should not be overlooked so I'll probably say that that's been the biggest, I think, takeaway from the last year. But definitely, I think we've seen significant reliance on our product over the last year and a half. No, that's really great. Han, we thank you for being on the podcast. We wish you all the best on the journey that's ahead of you. And maybe we'll circle back in a couple of years when you're closer to the billion. Yeah, I hope at that time it's going to be a couple billion people living in Africa. So Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're excited to see how many of those we can we can serve and that we can offer our product to. So definitely looking forward to being in touch with you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to keep you in touch with our progress. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.